to mission, God at work, faith in action. I'm Diane Becker along with Steve Saint, a missionary family. How many missionaries in your family? Well, Diane, there's uh, my mom and dad and my Aunt Rachel, my Uncle Phil, my Uncle Ben, um, myself, my two sisters and their husbands and our son, Jesse. Oh, and my stepdad. That's an amazing legacy. And that's the first story we have on tap for you, is three generations of the Saint family working in Ecuador. Deep in the Amazon rainforest of Ecuador is the village of Toñampade. The people here lead a calm, quiet life in the lush tropics by the river Curare. In the center of the village, there is a church. And in the center of the church is a quote from the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes shall not perish, but have eternal life. This tribal group call themselves Waudani, which simply means we the people, but the world remembers them as the Aukas, savages. January 1956. Five young men, all working as missionaries to Ecuador, joined together for Operation Auca. Nate Saint, innovative mission aviation fellowship pilot, loving husband and father of three. Jim Elliott, husband and father, athlete and honors graduate from Wheaton College. Ed McCulley, Jim's college companion and an outstanding college athlete, husband and father, he had already been working in the remote parts of Ecuador. Roger Udarian, World War II paratrooper, experienced with the Hivero headhunters of the Ecuadorian rainforest, father of two. Pete Fleming, a newlywed from Washington University, gifted student of philosophy and the Bible. Like the other four, he had committed his life to serving Jesus Christ and making him known to those who had never heard. These five were compelled by the love of Christ to enter the territory of one of the most isolated, feared, and savage tribes in Ecuador, the Aucas. When I came to Ecuador, there was almost nothing known about this group that were then known as Aucas, except that they killed on their borders. And nobody had ever gone into them and come out unscathed. Either they were speared with chanta palm spears or or they were killed outright nobody had ever spent overnight in the tribe as far as i know the killings were rampant within the tribal groups themselves within the family groups it was it was incredible unbelievable the amount of killings within the group everybody knew that they killed invaders on their borders but nobody knew that they killed within their own families. The Aucas believed that death must be avenged. Even death by snake bite was considered an act of witchcraft, a murder to be avenged. Vengeance on the accused killer was death for death, and death to his entire family, lest they survive and take revenge. It was a downward cycle of senseless slaughter. In the old days, we just speared back and forth, back and forth. They speared, we speared, until there were only a few left. We even killed one another in the same family group. I used to live furious at everybody, but now I do not live furious anymore. God says, now you are forgiven. And I know I'm forgiven for all these spearings. It's almost incredible to believe the past life that Gikita has had. Uh, he has speared, one time he counted out on his fingers that he had speared 12 men. Gikita was the oldest. He was the lead killer on the beach when they killed the missionaries. He was just my brother Nate's age. My brother Nate was the oldest of the five missionaries at 33, and uh, Gikita was the oldest of the killers, and all the other men were comparatively young men. The first week of January 1956, the five men set up a camp of welcome to the Aucas. 
Their hopes were high on building friendships in order to bring the story of God's love and forgiveness through Jesus Christ to the Alcas. Since God has made our whole selves, there is great joy in realizing who is our Creator. This realization is to permeate every area and level of life in appreciation of beauty, mountains, music, poetry, knowledge, people, science, even in the tang of an apple. God is there to reflect the joy of his presence in the believer who will realize God's purposes in all things. I will die to self. I will begin to ask God to put me in a service of constant circumstances where to live Christ. I must die to self. I will be alive unto God that I may learn to love him with my heart, mind, soul, and body. God, I pray thee, light these idle sticks of my life, and may I burn for thee. Consume my life, my God, for it is thine. I seek not a long life, but a full one like you, Lord Jesus. When the Lord Jesus asks us to pay the price for world evangelization, we often answer without a word. We cannot go. We say it costs too much. God knew what the price was going to be. He didn't hold back his only son, but gave him up to pay the price for our failure and sin. We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. Thine is the battle. Thine shall be the praise when passing through the gates of pearly splendor, victors, we rest with thee through endless days. What was yet unknown to the world was how frightened the feared Alcas were. The Alcas feared everyone, especially outsiders. They believed that all outsiders, Kawudi, were non-human cannibals. On Sunday, January 8, the Alcas sent decoys to draw the men apart to separate them for a surprise attack. Gakita then led Nimanga, Dewey, Kimo, Menkaye, and Nampa in a rapid and merciless spearing. The young missionaries were able-bodied and had guns. At least one gun was fired in the air during the attack, but was surrendered in the end. Nate, Jim, Ed, Pete, and Roger had come to give life, not to take it. Uh, my first encounter with Gikita that I remember individually was that somebody got to talking about what happened on the beach with photographs and he said those men tried to kill us with guns and by that time he knew what a gun was. I said, oh no, Gikita, they didn't. They took the guns to scare you but they promised the Lord they would never kill out because they would die first. And Gikita had lived all his life in a culture of revenge to the nth degree and he just trembled uh, it was just like an Ecuadorian earthquake. He just trembled from head to foot. Never in his life had he heard of a person who would die rather than kill. And uh, I think that was the beginning of his salvation. I'm going to meet Nate Saint in heaven. Before, I did badly. But then we will meet again and we'll just wrap our arms around each other and be happy. Uh, as I look back, I can only feel that it took a big thing like five fine young men giving their lives and not saving them when they could have and not venging those deaths, their families not venging those deaths. It took a big thing like this to break through the pattern that the enemy, Satan, has had through the years to keep these people under his control. And we can only thank the Lord for that and say that these five men died doing what they most wanted to do. A 
A sunny day in June 1992, 36 years after the brutal spearings on Palm Beach, Wycliffe Bible translators present the Alcas, now known as the Waodani, copies of the Bible, God's carving in their own language. Gekita is there, as is Kimo and Dewey, all participants in the surprise attack on the five missionaries that began this story. Dayum is there as well, the first Waodani believer, she assisted Rachel in the earliest work of Wadani Bible translation. In the old days, my people would mark a trail through the jungle by carving a mark on a tree on each side of the trail. This would guide you on a reliable path. God's Word is a reliable path. I call God's Word God's carving. We tell our people when we die, we want you to tell about God's carving to others. Go farther and farther into the jungle and tell others so that they can live well. Before, we did not know anything. Who was there to tell us? And if we do not tell the others, they will not be happy either. We must take this gospel to many others so that they will live happily as we do. When I was a child, sleeping on my father's chest in a hammock, they speared him, and I was dumped on the ground. My mother fled, but later they got her. In time, they speared my four older brothers. Dayuma's father raised me. Crying a lot, I grew up. Kimo was the first pastor we had in the tribe, and he's a real man of prayer. He prays for his people. He prays over the problems as he sees them. He's a peacemaker. If you would believe, this would be good. I became a believer in Jesus. How can I keep quiet? I have to speak again and again and again for my Lord. All of you listening should hear and believe. If you do not listen, how will you ever believe? Jesus said he created eyes to see and a mouth to speak, and ears to hear, and believe, believe, and live well. We didn't live well. We killed off all the old ones, and we just lived in the jungle. We didn't even have homes. We had to run. We lived in one place one month, and then we had to flee to another place. We lived fleeing. We couldn't live in one place. We had to flee and flee our enemies when they came to spear. And that's the way we lived. Dewey was the youngest of all the killers. I figured he'd been about a sophomore in high school. And uh, uh, Dewey was just one of the kids that was commandeered to go along on the spearing raids. Seeing we lived badly, God sent his son, and his son died for everybody. His blood dripped and dripped, and it was for all the world he sent his son Jesus. God and his carving have taught me to go beyond, to carry the word about his death and resurrection to other people, farther and farther on in the jungle. I got to thinking the other day that thinking of these men, Dewey's father was speared and his mother was captured and taken to the outside. Kimo's parents were both speared when he was very young. And Gikita's father was speared before he was born. And his mother was speared shortly after. And uh, they didn't have anything in their background that showed them any different kind of life than the one that they had been living in going to live and work among the people who had killed their loved ones, Rachel Saint after the death of her brother and Elizabeth Elliot after the death of her husband gave the Waldani a compelling and challenging example of God's love and forgiveness. On November 11, 1994, Rachel Saint went home to be with the Lord she so dearly loved and served. Her grave is located near the church she helped to establish among the Waodani, the people who knew her as Nemo, which means star. The Waodani saw Rachel as a star, a light in the darkness of a vast sky of death that had held them in fear for many years. 
During the years Rachel lived and worked among the Waodani, her young nephew, Steve Saint, came to visit her in her jungle home. On one of those visits, Steve was baptized by two of the men who had speared his father that day on Palm Beach in 1956. Two men who had not only become Steve's friends, but who had become his spiritual elders as well. After Rachel's death, a new clearing was established and called by her Waodani name, Nemo Ampade. Here in 1995, 40 years after the death of his father, Steve Saint, his wife Ginny, and their children came to live among the Waodani. We went to live with the Waodani um, at their request, but that isn't why we went. We went because we felt that God was leading us to go. We felt that he was telling us to go. And uh, so it really was a matter of obedience. It's one thing, I've lived in the jungles. It was one thing for me to go down there and live. It was another thing for Ginny and Sean and Stephanie and James and Jesse to go down and live there. And that came. And the Lord made it equally as clear to Ginny uh, to the point where we knew that not to go would have been disobedient. When Dawa finally put it so forcefully to me, saying, you must come, um, what do you say? Then I put the question to them. I said, what do you say I should do if I come? And they gave me three things. They said, one, we want you to help us with medicine. Properly interpreted, they wanted more, more um, certainty in medical care. Um, number two was they said, come and teach us teach us how to deal with the outside world that so wants to dominate us and who's taken away our freedom, who's taken advantage of us so often. And the third one was uh, protect us. Their territory is being invaded by oil companies and uh, colonists from outside, uh, tourists coming in and, and without their invitation. After working on lots of those things, um, I finally came to the conclusion that the only legitimate thing that I had to work on for their benefit, um, secular, religious, was to help them reestablish their church. I really believe that the church and the reestablishment of their church is the only chance that they have to continue to exist as a, um, as a culture, as an individual people. They need now to, to administer and carry out and exert authority over those things that they have started now, that we've helped them start. And then we'll go back and we'll, we'll live with them and help them again as God leads us to and as they invite us to. I think probably the most important thing that Aunt Rachel to taught me, I think, was what she impressed on me the last time that we talked before she died. Aunt Rachel just sort of called me to her and said, uh, you know, Stevie boy, when I came to serve the Lord, I really didn't have much to offer Him. And then she went through a list of things that she couldn't do. She said, I, I never was much of a linguist. She said, I was pretty old by the time I came down here to work with the Waodani. She said, I, I couldn't teach and preach nearly as well as other people. I was no theologian. And she went on and on like this. And uh, then I asked her, I said, Auntie Rachel, what do you think it it was that the Lord used. And she thought for a minute and she said, well, Stevie boy, I love the Lord with all my heart. She said, and I trusted him completely. She was willing to obey him because she trusted that what he wanted her to do was best for her. And then she paused for a little bit and she said, and I guess I learned to persevere. I just learned to keep on going in whatever he gave me to do. And when a man, a common man, an ordinary woman, commits their lives to Christ, he does uncanny and supernatural things with it. I think that that's the story of Aunt Rachel's life. I think that that's the story of Palm Beach. And I think in a very small way, that's what I saw this year that the Lord used us in ways that are very hard to measure, that we may never be able to see. But inside, He let us know 
that he was pleased with us, not for what we were doing, but because we were being obedient. During his time in the jungle, Steve caught a vision for helping the Waodani and others like around the world. He formed a mission called ITEC, the Indigenous People's Technology and Education Center near Ocala, Florida. Rather than creating dependence upon missionaries and their benevolence, ITEC works to enable indigenous churches to become self-supporting, self-governing, and self-propagating. Today, with the help of ITEC, the Waodani even fly planes, carry out evangelistic strategies, practice dentistry, lead jungle tours, and under the leadership of their own elders, follow God's carving the Bible. Steve's commitment to the remote peoples of the world remains firm despite personal tragedy. In July of 2000, the Saint family endured the unexpected passing of Stephanie Rachel Saint, Steve's only daughter, named for his Aunt Rachel. The Waodani people deeply cherished Stephanie and called her Star, the same name they had given to Rachel Saint. Steve has walked through many difficult valleys, yet his hope remains firm. I can tell you for me, these are times when as a little boy you're told that your daddy's never coming home. When as a um, approaching middle-aged man, your Aunt Rachel, who's so dear to you and is such a tie with so many things that you hold dear, is gone. And, and you have to participate in putting the shell into a hole in the ground. And then even more so when, when my only daughter is suddenly beyond my control, taken out of my protective custody. Those are times when you don't posture. And I can tell you honestly that this hope that is within me is not something that I aspire to. It's something that is it's very, very real. It doesn't take the pain and anguish away, but it smooths this. this comforting balm over that I know will make it heal. The hole will never fill in as long as I live here. These precious ones that we've lost. But there aren't jagged and raw edges either. There's this, there's this emptiness that I have a hope inside me that knows that it will be filled again. We hope that you understand that God can use you in amazing ways too. All he needs is for you to be available. We usually have this picture of missionaries as being spiritual giants and they're just ordinary people letting God use them. Thanks for watching this week. We'll see you next time on Mission. Mm -hmm.